Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started um, this afternoon. So I am Hannah Becker. Um, I'm a partner at Becker Digital, and I'm excited to join you on this discussion today into the role social media plays in government communications and public engagement. Um, it's a really exciting topic that has evolved a lot over the past few years. Um, so very, very excited to kind of dive into this with you today. Just to give you kind of a quick overview of what we'll be touching on, we're gonna talk about the unique role that social media plays in public engagement. We're gonna look at some best practices, and this is focused on local, state, and federal government agencies and companies that work with them. Um, we're gonna talk about generational differences between baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen Zers as it relates to social media kind of attitudes, behavior, expectations. And then we'll look at a few agencies that are just rocking it out on social media. So if you're someone that, um, you know, does better kind of seeing an example, uh, we'll, we'll provide those. And then we'll look at how just some kind of quick, easy steps, how your agency can implement an effective social media strategy. So kind of regardless of whether your budget's a thousand bucks or, you know, a hundred thousand bucks, you'll have kind of a step, some playbook that you can implement in terms of, okay, how are we going to create a strategy and how are we going to actually utilize it? So before we jump into today's content, I did want to provide you with a quick intro to our company. Um, as I mentioned, I'm um, with Becker Digital. I'm a partner. Uh, we're a communications and marketing company located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. So just a few hours outside of Washington, D.C., we were founded in 2015 and have worked with government agencies and nonprofit organizations ever since on things like digital strategy, social media, um, and web design. So we're certified uh, by the SBA as a hub zone small business, CV verified service disabled veteran owned small business, and we're also SWAM certified by the Commonwealth of Virginia. And here's just a quick uh, kind of overview of our capabilities. Um, it's We focus on creative design, marketing consulting. We do a lot of Section 508 compliance um, and web design. Most of our background involves kind of connecting government agencies and nonprofits with some specific uh, populations. And these include the disabled community, uh, multi-generational audiences, military and veteran populations, as well as rural populations. Our team, uh, in terms of leadership, my partner, Jeremy Becker, uh, is a retired U.S. Army officer and Operation Enduring Freedom veteran. Uh, he focuses on providing strategic consulting and project management for government clients. And then I've, I come from um, public sector communications and academia background. So, my, my focus is digital strategy, social media, organizational training. And here's just a few of the organizations that we've worked with over in the recent uh, few years. And there's more information on our website, like case studies and stuff to kind of give you an idea of the scope. But that is all I have in terms of an intro and we can uh, jump into today's content. So managing social media for government agencies can be really challenging. Um, probably preaching to the choir here, but managing social media for government agencies, very, very different from managing social media for for-profit businesses or even nonprofit organizations. And it's government social media, it kind of presents some challenges, but also some opportunities. And I wanted to kind of open up today by looking at those because these do shape kind of what's considered best practice. In terms of challenges, 
government agencies, I mean, they're held to a much higher standard. They may be subject to more regulation or public scrutiny than your for-profit entities. You've got a broad target audience when you're looking at a government agency. So this, if it's a local government, this could be just everyone living in a certain zip code. And that can span multiple generations and a lot of diversity across multiple demographics. For federal agencies, I mean, potentially your target audience is, you know, national and for some international, depending on partnerships and scope of work. So you're looking at these broad, broad audiences. Also, public trust in government is at an all time low, um, which is challenging. So you've got widespread distrust of government agencies, but also distrust in terms of the information they're putting out. Many people within the public may not view this information as credible or reliable or trustworthy. And so that's kind of a challenge that government communicators are facing today. And we'll talk about how to work with or around that in here in a few slides. And then also government communications, um, you know, you may find yourself dealing with an unhappy public and this can result in crisis communications management, which is something that requires resources so people, budget, to do well, and that's something that most government agencies don't have a surplus of. And so that can create a challenge, especially when it comes to social media, because um, you know a negative post or a negative experience that a user puts up about an organization on social media can just spread like wildfire, um, even if it's not true or, you know, so it's, you're just, you're dealing with a highly flammable kind of environment. Now government, uh, social media and government agencies does present, you know, opportunities. Um, you've got the potential to impact many, many people and improve the quality of their life through social media communications, which is really cool. Uh, kind of a really cool thing to, to do for your career. Um, we saw this time and time again during the pandemic, uh, you know, for mi millions of Americans that were social distancing, social media became sort of a lifeline for them in terms of where they're getting their information about you know, updates regarding the pandemic, public health recommendations, how to keep your, yourself, your family safe. Um, and they were turning to social media accounts by local health departments, all the way up to federal agencies. Um, and in, in, in this way, you know, connecting people with that information, getting them registered or connected to get vaccines, um, even distributing information about treatment options for COVID-19. A lot of this occurred through social media posted by government agencies and ultimately you know, saved lives. Um, social media can be a great way to restore public trust. We mentioned public trust in government agencies being low. Um, you know, social media, can be a really good mechanism for which agencies can build trust with their target audience. And then also, you know, you can drive positive change uh, by equipping the public with resources and information about government programs, government support, um, you know, through your agency, you know, you have the potential to change and impact so many lives for the good. So I think social media, when it comes to government communications, is you know a critical component, and that's why it's so important that government agencies know know how and are equipped to do it well. So I wanted to look at a few best practices before we get into the generational marketing and some examples. Uh, so first best practice, you want to have an engagement plan in place. Successful social media is not just posting stuff. 
We don't just post stuff online. All that is is one way communication, just broadcasting information. The cool thing about social media is it provides this platform for two way communication. So you're having a conversation as a government agency with the public. Um, and we want to optimize that. We want to utilize that for our social media to be successful. So we need to have a policy in place. We need to have written social media policy in terms of engagement. How do you respond to comments? How do you respond to positive comments? How do you respond to negative comments? Have all of that written out so that you can have multiple members of your team uh, engaging as the agency online. That being said, engagement, that type of engagement online can take a lot of time, can take a lot of people. So that needs to be built into your social media strategy, recognizing that this isn't something you're going to want to necessarily just do on the fly. You're going to burn out your folks doing that. Um, so you want to have a system in place for routine engagement online. And we'll look at some agencies that do that uh, really well here in a few slides. Second, we want to focus on developing public trust. Social media is a great way to build trust with an audience. Uh, on social media, they can get to know the agency. They can see that the agency is trustworthy, is, is made up of people that hold themselves accountable to the mission of the agency. Social media allows this kind of element of transparency in a way um, that we can utilize to, to cultivate trust among the public. To build trust through social media, one really effective way is to humanize the digital content. So we want to showcase, we're not, we're not just posting press releases on Facebook, okay? That's, that's all just one way information. What we want to do is we want to showcase the people behind the government agency and the government agency's mission. So this could be things like spotlights on employees, team members. You could interview people from the community that's lives have been positively impacted by this, by the government agency. Um, really use multiple types of content. So the written word, images, videos, to tell a story about what this agency does and how it makes lives better, how it makes our communities better. Storytelling is, is an ancient art, but social media provides a lot of features of which government communicators can utilize storytelling to truly tell the story of the agency and develop trust, develop a relationship with the public. We're gonna to wanna to prioritize a multi-platform social media strategy. We're gonna look at this from a generational standpoint. That's not the only standpoint to look at in terms of what social media platforms does my agency need to be on. Um, but we're going to want to be on more than just one or two social media apps. And the reason is our target audience is most likely on multiple apps. And we'll look at the generational breakdown on that in a minute. But we want to be online where our audience is. So, for example, if we're targeting or if we want to reach Gen Zers, you know, Facebook is not the platform to do that on. LinkedIn, not the platform to do that on. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, those are the platforms Gen Zers are going to be on. So we're going to want to know where our audience is and then prioritize a multi-platform social media strategy. Now, the trick from an operational standpoint in terms of a multi-platform social media strategy is that all these social media apps are different, right? YouTube, is prioritizes or, or, you know, videos are the main content. Twitter, you're going to need some witty copy, maybe some images. Um, you know, Instagram, you're going to need pretty pictures. Each platform takes different types of content. So someone's going to have to create all these different types of content for these multiple platforms. So that's something that you'll want to have kind of accounted for in terms of your social media strategy. And then finally, 
we're going to want to evaluate our social media content from a DEIA that's diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility perspective. So government agencies serve diverse populations. And what we put out online on social media should reflect the diverse populations that we serve. So DEIA practices help us build connections with our target audience. And so in terms of communications and marketing, DEIA practices look like uh, evaluating, you know, who are we featuring in our social media content across multiple demographic variables, uh, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, religious affiliation, even geographic location or background, military service, um, physical ability and or disability. How are, who are we portraying? How are we portraying them? Accessibility comes in specifically with government agencies and then companies that work with government agencies is that we need to be Section 508 compliant. And if this is the first time you're hearing of Section 508, that's okay, don't panic. Um, if you go to the Becker Digital blog and or webinar tab, we've got a bunch of stuff, training, um, blog posts, webinars to help you understand Section 508 compliance specific to social media. So it gives you kind of a need to know rundown list of, okay, here's how I can improve the accessibility of my agency's digital space. So DIA practices and marketing communications could take their own webinar. They're not going to today. But uh, over on the Becker Digital blog, we do, our most recent post is about integrating DEIA practices into your communications and marketing. Okay, so I wanted to talk about generational differences in social media. So everything from attitudes, behavior, usage stats, what each generation is looking for when they get on social media. Most government agencies, most, are tasked with reaching multiple generations. Now, every generation is not a monolith. We've got diversity within each generation. These are just the concept of generational marketing. It's just that we generations are these cohorts of people that have experienced similar experiences they may have encountered similar challenges economically, sociologically, politically, um, and it shaped things. It shaped belief systems. It shaped consumer buying habits and patterns and social media, tech, ad tech adoption, stuff like that. So what we do in terms of generational marketing and social media is we want to be aware of who the main generations are within our target audience and know where they are online, what are they looking for when they get online? And that helps us hone our strategy when it comes to social media. So I did wanna just kind of walk you through four key adult generations in the United States and look at how they differ in terms of social media. So the first adult generation I wanted to look at baby boomers. Um, they were born approximately 1946 to 1964. Uh, it is important to note on these birth year ranges, you may see some variation in research and publications on this. This is just kind of the, the range we'll use today for kind of a working definition of who these are. Um, generational ranges, the birth years, they do tend to change as, as you know, people go through life and, and different observations are made. But for baby boomers, we'll go with 1946 to 1964. So right now, baby boomers are many of them at the peak of their careers. Uh, some are retiring, some are becoming grandparents for the first time. Baby boomers were the largest adult generation for the majority of their adulthood in the United States. Um, they, they make up the majority of spending in the US economy. 
and uh, and we're a generation that were really influenced by a few key events. So the Cold War, civil rights, Kennedy assassination, Vietnam War, the rise of television. Um, they were not digital natives, right? So baby boomers were adults before people had personal computers, much less smartphones, uh, in, in their homes, in their lives. So they're adapted to technology later on, but they are prolific users of tech, including social media. Gen Xers are the adult generation uh, behind baby boomers. So birth range, 1965 to 1979 to 80. Uh, they are the smallest adult generation and they've been kind of sandwiched between this massive cohort of baby boomers and this massive cohort of millennials. Um, but Gen, Gen Xers have done pretty well uh, overall. They are the only generation to have recovered the wealth that they lost during the Great Recession. Gen Xers, in terms of what's going on in their lives, uh, many of them are juggling career, caregiving, parenting, home ownership. Um, they are the smallest of the adult age generation, but they are projected to be larger than baby boomers by the year 2028. So things, events that influence Gen Xers, the AIDS epidemic, Challenger explosion, Desert Storm, and the whole tech revolution. Millennials are the generation after Gen Xers, born between 1981 and 1994 to 1996. The jury's still out on where the cutoff date for that one is. But millennials are massive. They're the largest generation in American history. Um, and they're continuing to grow through immigration. They are also noted as the most educated, as defined as having the most college degrees um, in the US. So events that influenced millennials' value systems are things like the fall of the Berlin Wall, Great Recession, uh, Global War on Terror, uh, September and, um, 11th, the terrorist attacks September 11th, and social media. And then finally, we've got Gen Zers. So these are our, what most would kind of consider our young adults now, our, our new college students. Um, Gen Zers born between 1997 and 2012. They tend to be children of Gen Xers. Um, and most Gen Zers have no memory of a world without technology or even a world without smartphones or social media. So they are true digital natives. They are the most racially and ethnically diverse generation in American history. Um, Gen Zers are prolific users of tech, 98% of them on a smartphone and nearly half, nearly half of Gen Zers spend more than 10 hours a day on their mobile devices. That is a statistic that just makes me cringe. Um, but if you know a Gen Zer, you probably have, have someone in, in mind in terms of prolific, prolific users of technology, very active on social media. So to give you a, kind of an idea of how these generations engage differently on social media and some differences in terms of the role social media plays in their lives. So you can see on these charts, this is the reasons for using social media networks. So the intent behind logging on or getting on a social media app. Baby boomers, uh, the dark blue bar, Gen X, light blue, millennials, the pink, Gen Z, light green. So baby boomers are disproportionately higher than the rest of the generations for getting on social media to share pictures and updates. When I think about baby boomers, you know, they're broadcasting information, broadcasting information on social media. Gen Zers, so the opposite end of the generational spectrum, at least the one that we discussed, uh, which are in light green, they're disproportionately higher getting on social media to follow celebrities, to seek inspiration, uh, to influence others, to get involved in political activities. Um, so you can see it's, it's different intent in terms of 
the role social media plays in their lives and why they're getting on. Interestingly, with Gen Zers, uh, I guess I think it was last week, um, a statistic came out that 40% of Gen Zers are using the social media apps, TikTok and Instagram to search for information instead of Google, which is a well, you know, well-established search engine. Uh, so they're going online on social media, searching different organizations, searching different products, doing research on social media, seeking out user generated content, as opposed to going to Google and finding published content or content from that organization. So this is different generationally, and that's just kind of a unique generational behavior trend that I would encourage you to watch um, and just kind of keep that on your radar. I think we'll continue to see that grow. So overall uh, in the United States, this chart doesn't have it, but um, Facebook and YouTube are the most popular social media apps. That's across all US adults. There are differences in terms of what social media platform is most popular for certain generations. And this can change over time. And Facebook is the perfect example of this. Uh, back when Facebook started over, and now I guess uh, 18 years ago, um, or, or maybe even a little, little more than that, Facebook required you to have a uh, .edu email address to sign up for an account. So it was primarily college students, which meant at the, that time they were millennials. So the, the, the majority of their user base were millennials. Today, the fastest growing demographic of Facebook users is actually baby boomers. So in less than 20 years, we've seen a shift in terms of Facebook being super popular with millennials to now being super popular with baby boomers. It's just an example of how some of these apps in terms of who's on what can change. Um, in terms of millennials and Gen Zers, they're not prolific users or frequent users of Facebook not as, as, as boomers and Gen Xers tend to be. Instead, they tend to be on things like Instagram. Um, Gen Zers specifically are prolific users of Snapchat and TikTok. Uh, so depending on who makes up your target audience, these are just kind of user demographics and trends to think about when you're figuring out, okay, what platforms does my agency need to be on? Um, as I mentioned, so we just looked at generations, which is age, right, and in terms of demographics. There are a lot of other demographics out there to evaluate in terms of what social media would be most appropriate for your agency. Um, one that's interesting is... Uh, well, I thought this chart was interesting because this was most popular social media apps by state, and it was based on Google search trends. So if you look at the red states on here, Pinterest was the most popular app for these states. Um, so we're looking at, we're seeing Missouri, Wisconsin, Nebraska, South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Utah, Oregon, Louisiana, um, a few on the East Coast, but not many. So primarily concentrated in areas that have a, a large rural population. Interestingly, if you look at Pinterest user demographics, what they report, Pinterest is, they have a higher concentration of users in rural areas. So physical or geographic location, whether it's urban, suburban, or rural, can also play into what social media platforms are really popular. So that's just something to be cognizant of as it relates to your agency. Okay, so I wanted to look at a few government agencies that succeed on social media. Sometimes it's easier to have kind of like a working rubric or an example of, oh, so that's good. How can I integrate that into my agency? At least it is for me. So the first one I wanted to look at um, was NASA. NASA does an amazing job online. Um, 
they have a very impactful mission that deals in a lot of complex things. So, but they're following their social media, their target audience, you know, can range all ages, all across the nation or the world for that matter, a variety of different socioeconomic backgrounds, educational levels, um, genders, locations, wide range. They use social media to inform and educate about the important work that the agency does, and they do a terrific job at it. They also use social media to spark interest in the mission of NASA, what NASA is trying to accomplish, what NASA has accomplished, what NASA is working on, and how it relates to our lives. Over on the right, you'll see um, NASA utilizes the live event feature within Facebook to provide levels of interaction with their followers. This is really important, something to think about how you could integrate interaction, interactive events in your agency social media strategy. The popular social media apps have made it easier than ever to create live events. Um, this can be a great way to really engage your followers, interact. It can take, you know, some resources, some planning in terms of putting it on. Um, it's free to host these. However, you know, you, there is a lot of planning that goes in. So that's just something to think about. In terms of a state agency, uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources, I love their social media content. Um, they, they put out great content, so great photos, great videos. I love their copy. You can see on the posts on the left, uh, they use kind of a, an engaging and formal tone that they write in. They use emojis. It's kind of factoidy. It's easy to read. You learn something cool about the environment. Um, but what they do really, really well is that the Iowa Department of Natural Resources engages with their followers. So if you see over to the right, it's a screen grab of just this is like normal, common day discourse on the state agency's page. They're answering questions, they're engaging with followers. Um, and this type of engagement does a lot in terms of your social media reach and also building trust with the community. So ultimately, that's what we're all about, not about just getting a bunch of clicks or racking up a ton of followers. Those can be good things, but ultimately we want to cultivate public trust and we wanna build long-term relationships with the public that we serve. So uh, social media can be a good way to do that. And the Iowa Department of Natural Resources is really rocking it out on that front. Um, in terms of a local agency, I wanted to highlight a local police department, local to uh, where I live in Virginia. Uh, the Lexington Police Department is a is in the same county that Becker Digital is headquartered in. So they do a really good job at reaching out to the community, the local community. You can see on the left, they use social media to uh, broadcast information about like community engagement events, like their community walks that I believe they host once a week. Um, and it's just a really good way for the community to get to know the police department. And then on the right, the Lexington Police Department recently uh, started a mounted unit. And so they were inviting the public to come meet the horses, meet the mounted officers, and also decorate horseshoes um, as part of a community engagement event. And they utilized Facebook primarily to get the word out about these types of events. And they do a great job and they, they, get, they get good photos um, that are kind of behind the scenes and candid and in the moment, which really humanizes the department. And then another federal agency that uh, was very innovative in terms of how they utilize social media was the US Navy. So in 2019, 
the Navy wanted to increase um, engagement and interest among Gen Zers. So these are these are our youngest of the adult generation currently. So they launched an influencer campaign. And when most people think about influencer campaigns, they think about like fashion brands and celebrities and um, the Navy really thought outside the box here. And they wanted, they integrated influencer marketing into their recruiting strategy. So they identified a few key or uh, very popular YouTube influencers and they engage them in this opportunity to go on a ship, go on a submarine, follow around these service members for a behind the scenes tour, film this stuff and put it online with the objective of they were going to use these people's YouTube channels to reach tech savvy potential recruits that may have never considered military service as a career option before. Maybe they didn't think it was accessible to them. Maybe they didn't know um, what military service entailed. Uh, military service in the United States, especially over the past 20 years, has been heavily concentrated in families. So the majority of DOD recruits across all branches it, for the past 20 years come from military families or have a first degree or second degree relative that has also served. So the Navy utilizing this influencer marketing campaign is able to provide potential recruits with some what similar kind of an inside knowledge uh, of the the service or at least firsthand accounts of what it is what it means to serve in the military and what opportunities would be available to you um so they got this behind the scenes look through the lens of someone they trusted a popular youtube influencer to see what daily life of being a sailor supporting the military mission was all about which is super cool so anyway the influencer campaign is called sailor verse and let me, they've got episodes online if you just Google it. Um, super cool to watch. Uh, a lot of great information that can also be inspirational for you as a government communicator. And you're trying to think out of the box because social media is so saturated. There's so much stuff on it. There's so much noise online. Being creative, like how the Navy was with this influencer campaign, can help cut through that noise and um, position your government agency in front of audiences that maybe they've heard of you, but they just kind of tuned you out. So um, that's just kind of food for thought. Okay, so to, for any social media to be successful, you got to have a strategy. It doesn't just happen. You need to have a plan. You need to have a plan to not only do it, but also sustain it, reevaluate it, perfect it, um, and so on. So all good strategies start with research. And this is similar with social media. We want to know our audience. We need a clearly defined target audience. Who are they? If you're a local agency, it may just be everyone inside the city limits. Uh, you're going to want to know what the demographics are. Who are these people? What are their what are their concerns? What are their priorities? What's on their mind? You know, when they're worried at night, what keeps them up? What what's stressing them out? Um, what do they think about your agency? What do they think about the community? And and have this well defined kind of description of your target audience from which you can work from. Secondly, we want to plan. We want to use this research that we work up on our target audience and develop a plan for how our agency will reach them on social media. Once we have the demographic information on our target audience, we can then compare and contrast to social media usage. Today, all we looked at was generations, generational trends and stuff. Um, that's that's a good starting point for target market or target audience research, but that's not the end all. So we want to make sure we, we want to look at who 
our community consists of, and then figure out where they are online, why they're getting online, what other companies and agencies are they following online, what type of content are they engaging with. Um, these are two elements of communications that can take some heavy lifting in terms of time, people. Uh, Becker Digital, this is something that is kind of our bread and butter in terms of government agencies. We frequently work with government agencies, especially at the local and state level that have limited budgets and they've got small departments. So they don't have the time to do this. This stuff can take three to four months to put together depending on the scope. So what they'll do is outsource the research part and the strategy part to us. We'll work it all up and then we give them a strategy that's just turnkey and then they can go and implement it in-house with their existing team. Um, third thing to look at people. So who do you have that's gonna work on social media? Uh, if it's just one person that is tasked with not only doing all the research, but creating the content, posting the content, also engaging on the content, you, you, that person is going to get burned out. Um, so the scope of what you're trying to do will need to accommodate for, you know, who do you have on this? Good social media cannot be completely automated. It requires people involvement. And then resources, so time and money, how much is going to be required to implement that plan? And then, you know, do you have it? Um, and what can you cut out and what should you prioritize on that front? We're also going to want to do a routine performance evaluation of social media. So every government agency is going to be different in terms of what works online. So having this type of reevaluation or an evaluation of the strategy that you've put into place lets you tweak that strategy and, and make it better so that your social media is more effective. I recommend doing an assessment a minimum of once a quarter. Other things to think about in terms of evaluation, uh, I would encourage you to look into social media listening and monitoring uh, products um, and see how that can be added to the mix, especially as it relates to user generated content about your agency. Um, there's a post on our blog about user generated content that links some really good and budget friendly social media listening and monitoring services. Um, and then you're also going to want to stay up to date in terms of continuing education on government social media. So the only thing constant about social media is that it is always changing. And as government communicators, we need to stay on top of all these trends. So app feature changes, user trends, demographic shifts, all the stuff. Um, we need to stay, stay on top of that. So agencies like Becker Digital can help um, with all aspects of the social media kind of plan. Our services are customized to the needs of the government agency. So we do handle small projects like for local government agencies all the way on up to much broader campaigns. So a few key takeaways from today. I know it's a lot of information, but um, <laughs> Kind of just a few key takeaways to leave you with is that social media can be a great way for your government agency to build or to destroy public trust. It's all in how you use it. So if you do a really good job, you're cultivating public trust. If you do a really crappy job, you're just you're diminishing public trust. And it's already at a low point in America right now. So we really don't need to bring that down any anymore. Um, we want to prioritize two-way communication online. So when you're thinking about what am I going to post, how am I going to you know, make a splash here on social, it's not just about the information you're pushing out. It's about, okay, I'm going to post this cool thing, and then I'm going to have these engagement elements built in so that I am engaging with followers. And you want to be consistent with this. This isn't like a one and done thing. So you want someone dedicated within your department or your team to do that. Or you can use a government contracting agency like Becker Digital to handle the, the management and engagement. Um, we want to leverage storytelling to really strengthen our community relationships. Social media is a great 
storytelling platform. Um, you know, we want to build these long-term relationships and really show the public, the people and the mission and the impact of our government agency. Generational marketing strategies are important when it comes to social media. We want to be active online where our audience is. And, you know, not everyone is active on Facebook, as, as is not everyone active on Instagram or TikTok. So we want to think about where our audience is and make sure that we also have a really good presence on those social media channels. You know, and the other thing is that social media success is really a moving target. And I know that's very frustrating. Uh, most of tech tends to be this way. <laughs> About the time you get it figured out, they go and change something. So what worked last year for your government agency may not work this year when it comes to social media. So you just need to stay on top of trends and topics. Um, we do offer a, uh, a lot of resources. If you go to our website at becker-digital.com, you go to the resources tab, drop down. There's a blog, there's webinars. The webinar tab has a bunch of webinar recordings if there's some topic that you want to go much more in depth on. Um, and then also if you sign up for a newsletter, uh, we send out once a month just a roundup of webinars that we've we've posted with the recordings, upcoming webinars you can register for, blog posts, um, and just other industry related stuff that we're tracking on with the goal of kind of providing our clients and followers with a consolidated list of kind of like need to know when it comes to government communications, especially with social media. Um, so we do have an upcoming webinar. It's Thursday, August 4th, and it's social media strategies for rural populations. It's free. You just have to register to get, you know, to get the access link. Uh, I gave this talk a few weeks ago out at the uh, National Association of Government Communicators Communication School out in Louisville. Um, it's an in, it was an interesting topic that's not been covered a lot when it comes to communications. I'm from a rural area, live in a rural area. So this is one of my areas of expertise that I'm very passionate about and um, wanted to offer it in a webinar format in case you weren't able to, to get out to the communication school. We're gonna look at uh, the diversity that's in modern rural America, look at some misconceptions regarding rural populations, usage of technology and social media. And we're going to talk about how government and nonprofit organizations can connect with rural social media users. All right, and that is all that I have for today. Um, if you have any questions about anything we covered or just wanna talk more about government and social media, um, please send us an email at info at becker-digital.com. Um, you can check out our website for more information. And then also uh, very active on LinkedIn, feel free to reach out and connect on that platform. Um, I love discussing anything and everything as it relates to public sector communications and social media. It's a fascinating, constantly changing field. Um, so it's always exciting, never boring, um, but love hearing from, from folks that also work in the sector. So, um, and also all webinar registrants will get a link to the, the recording of this and just kind of a follow-up. Thank you. So I appreciate your time and attention today and hope you have a wonderful, um, wonderful afternoon.